The first thing we need to know about the inspector is that he is the proxy of J.B. Priestley, the playwright. He represents Priestley's views. And this is a political play, and so the views expressed are also political. As you probably know, J.B. Priestley was a socialist. And socialism is a belief in equality between the political classes, and in particular, socialists believed that the wealthy should not control the income of the poor. So factory owners like the Burlings would make a fortune out of low labour costs, and socialists believed that the profits of the business should be more fairly distributed amongst the workers. And indeed, many businesses were taken over by the government so that that wealth could be redistributed more fairly. But of course, the political message would never be heard unless the play was an entertainment. This is a picture of Alistair Sim playing the inspector in the film. And uh, it's difficult to believe now when you're watching something in black and white, but entertainment is what this play was. And a major part of the entertainment is in trying to work out who the inspector is, what strange powers does he have, and how does he control the Burlings and Gerald in order to manipulate them into revealing secrets they would rather not have known in public. So here we go, this is the first description of the inspector, and uh, he has a profound effect on the atmosphere when he arrives. The lighting changed from pink to brighter and harder. And this is symbolic. It's to show us how the inspector um, reveals harsher truths. And so the lighting is no longer um, rose-tinted, if you like, pink and um, innocent. It's uh, revealing their guilt and hence harder. And that's the inspector's purpose to reveal the guilt of the upper classes to themselves so that they will have a chance to change their ways. When you reread the play, you notice the ambiguity about him. Here, Edna points it out to us. He says his name's Inspector Gaul. And when we replay this, knowing that he isn't a real inspector, uh, suddenly the he says becomes much more meaningful. And he says it's important. Again, emphasising right from the very beginning that Edna may, might have suspected he was not a real inspector. And perhaps this is because um, Inspector Gould is on the side of the working classes. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's Edna who announces his arrival. It's uh, Edna's clearly placed here in order, to, in order to show that that the inspector is her natural ally. Priestly hopes that the inspector will have a massive impression, which is why he arrives with this impression of massiveness. A massive impression on the characters in the play, but also on the audience whose minds Priestley wants to capture and persuade that socialism is the way of the future. And then this instruction here, that he must stare hard at the person he addresses. It's quite unusual for a playwright to say exactly how the actor should behave. But because the inspector um, promotes Priestley's views, because he is Priestley's proxy, then Priestley is really clear about how he wants the inspector to behave. In order to be dramatic, the inspector's technique is to shock. But of course this is also Priestley's technique. And consequently we find that she's burnt from the inside out through drinking disinfectant. And this throwaway line, of course, is ironic. In other words, he's suggesting that this is the way the working classes are driven to behave by the rich. And that's emphasised again here. Suicide, of course. 
and that is contrasted to the fact that she was in great agony. He's keen to shock the audience again. There is also a suggestion that the inspector is somewhat of a feminist. It's these young women that he's protesting about. He sees the lot of the working class woman as much worse than that of the working class man. And by focusing on the vulnerability of women, he hopes to make it easier to change the mind of his audience, uh, both the real audience watching the play and the Burlings within the play. You will know that the inspector spells his name um, G-O-O-L-E, but this is a homophone for ghoul, a ghost, and there is a strong tradition in literature taken up by Dickens in A Christmas Carol of supernatural visions of the future, and the ghost of Christmas future operates very much like the inspector here. And consequently, he becomes interested when uh, he finds out that Mr. Croft is going to marry Miss Sheila Burling. He's very much interested in the future. And this marriage seems to be one of the main reasons for his visit. Uh, as we'll see at the end of the play, if Sheila accepts Gerald, then very likely there is no change, and the lessons that she claims to have learnt at the end of the play will be for nothing. But if she doesn't marry Gerald Croft, then there is a chance that the lessons have been learned. Many students struggle with this play and wonder why their English teachers bother to teach them it. They don't like having to watch a black and white video, and they very often don't get to go and see the uh, play itself. Um, and so it's for this reason, your teacher has a moral purpose. Um, all teachers really enter the profession hoping that they're going to make a difference. In other words, they want to make the world a better place. And they do that by trying to influence positively the young people that they teach. And this is a view that they share exactly with the inspector. If we were all responsible for everything that happened, said Burling, uh, it would be very awkward, wouldn't it? And the inspector's ironic reflection is, yes, it would be very awkward, but that's exactly how he thinks people should behave. Uh, so this is the socialist message that he carries, and it's, one's, it's one that uh, most teachers uh, feel, even if they don't vote for a socialist party, um, but they feel in terms of their responsibility uh, to everyone they meet. And so another way of looking at the inspector is seeing him as a teacher of morality and moral values. Priestley also reveals that the inspector's purpose is not just to find out who's responsible for the death of Eva. He's here to expose the role of business. Um, Burling tells the inspector that it's none of his business how he, Burling, runs his own business. It might be, you know, said the inspector. Um, so this is a clear signal uh, from Priestley that the inspector's purpose is also political. He's analysing the effects of capitalist business on the people they employ and, by definition, exploit. And they exploit them because of the low wages that are paid, uh, which we can see here. The inspector characterises this um, exploitation as taking the earth. Uh, in other words, in this metaphor, the capitalists are destroying the very planet that we live on. And that's a message that's very current today. Many people speculate that the inspector just seizes upon information as he discovers it. But if we look at this stage direction here, uh, where he says, are you sure you don't know? And he looks at Gerald, and then at Eric, and then at Sheila. There's a strong suggestion that actually he knows each of their parts uh, in the story of Eva Smith, or even three different women, which is possible. The alternative, that he doesn't know what they've done, is even more interesting, however, because then, when he looks hard at these characters, he is assuming that because they are upper class, they are bound to have exploited the working class. And this is an even more powerful political point. It means that confronting any member of the upper class, 
will reveal something that they've done that is evil in exploiting the working class. And that, if you like, is a more powerful way of suggesting that the upper classes are adversely exploiting the working class. And it's up to you to choose which interpretation of the inspector you prefer. Again, the inspector is really explicit about his purpose. I thought that it would do us all a bit of good if sometimes we tried to put ourselves in the place of these young women counting their pennies in their dingy little back bedrooms. And so you've got the contrast of the women's youth to the dinginess of the bedrooms that they live in. They're only at the back of the house because they're the poorest quality rooms that these women can afford because they only earn pennies. Again, emphasising how destitute they are because of the exploitation of the capitalists who employ them. The encounter with Sheila is really interesting. Uh, She reacts straight away, having seen the photograph, just as the inspector must have known she would. But her reaction, the sob and then running out, is perhaps more than he'd bargained for. The inspector puts the photograph back in his pocket and stares speculatively after her. And there's a sense that he's making up his mind here that perhaps he can use Sheila in order to support him. She becomes his ally at this point, but this stage direction suggests he didn't know that in advance. He perhaps expected Sheila to be just as defensive as Burling and Mrs Burling turn out to be, but Sheila seems to offer him some hope. Now the inspector is quite blunt in delivering Priestley's message. Gerald has this throwaway line, we're respectable citizens and not criminals, and the inspector counters, often, if it was left to me, I wouldn't know where to draw the line. And so he's making a really powerful point here, that the rich, because they are so powerful, naturally become criminal in their behaviour, because they're able to exploit people and get away with it. The inspector also has to compromise here. If we look at the death of Eva Smith logically, assuming that she is one person, then the sacking from Burling's factory has not led to her death because she had a good job at Millwards. But it's Sheila who gets her sacked from Millwards and therefore it's Sheila who makes her go to the Palace Bar where she effectively considers becoming a prostitute and then becomes Gerald's mistress. Uh, So, actually, the tragedy of Sheila can be directly traced... Sorry, the tragedy of Eva can be directly traced to Sheila's actions. But the inspector doesn't say that. He says, no, the tragedy is not entirely Sheila's fault. He needs to spread the blame across the other Burlings and Gerald. But interestingly, a logical approach would suggest that Sheila is indeed the most responsible for what happened. If she hadn't intervened, then uh, Eva would still have the job at Millwoods and would never have come across Eric and Gerald. We can see how difficult this compromise is for the inspector uh, when he turns on Sheila and says it's the power that she had that she abused that has led to her death. And he emphasises that here. Yes, but you can't. It's too late. She's dead. He wants to accuse her, and so would Priestley. However, this would mean that the play would, effect, in effect, stop here. Um, this is where the buck would stop. Uh, but the blame needs to be shared, because Priestley and the inspector is making a point about the whole of capitalist society. He's attacking the well-off, the rich If he can make the rich understand uh, why it had to happen, then they might change their ways, and that's why he's here. It's why he arrives in the play in the first place. And if we now return to the moment that the inspector arrived we realise that it's Burling's own words that seem to have invoked him, called 
his presence as though he were supernatural. These are Burling's words, that a man has to mind his own business and look after himself and his own. And it's this very capitalist view that we are not responsible for our actions to other people, only for our actions towards our family, that brings the inspector to the house. This is when we hear the sharp ring, because this is the view that the inspector needs to attack and demolish. In Act 2, the inspector wants to expose Gerald and Mrs Burling. Ironically, although he appears to be on the side of women, as we've seen in the analysis of Act 1, he doesn't actually want to keep Sheila there. Um, he's finished with her once he's asked her questions, because he's much more interesting in asking questions of Burling. Why? Because Burling is a male, and he's head of the household, and this is a patriarchal society. And what he wants to do is speak to the power that rules, because it's the power that rules that will change the world. And we should bear this in mind when we get to the end of the play, because when Sheila changes her mind and um, listens to the inspector's teaching, that is some success, but not sufficient success, because she can't change the world. It's Burling and her fiancé, Gerald, who hold the reins of power. The inspector in this section here is keen to emphasise the responsibility that they all face and in fact that we as an audience all face towards um, the other people with whom we interact. That is his moral and political message. With the upper classes he realises that they will all have done something wrong and so that all that is left for them to share, if not their wealth, is their guilt as to what they have done. And that's the purpose of his visit. Again, Priestley alludes to the possibly supernatural nature of the inspector um, when he says this, We often do on the young ones. An actual inspector wouldn't say this, and neither would a fraud. Um, this language is something mysterious that you might expect from a figure with supernatural authority and that is why the young are more impressionable. Alternatively if we don't wish to see him as a supernatural ghoul then we can see him as a teacher because again it is teachers whose job it is to impress uh, young people to change their world views. Either of these readings will fit Priestley's purpose in the play. Sheila also reveals the inspector's role in the dramatic structure of the play. It's the job of the other char characters to uh, put up walls, and it's the inspector's job to break them down, um, because it will be worse for the rich and powerful when those walls are breaking down, broken down, and for the audience it becomes more memorable. The inspector's job is to be impertinent, to question the class system. The inspector's purpose is also um, to give the characters some rope. Now this metaphor suggests that if they speak for long enough they will expose themselves so that they will hang themselves. But the violence of this image also shows how um, clearly Priestley is on the attack, uh, again suggesting that the upper classes are criminal and indeed capable of murder, in the sense that they have contributed to the death of Eva Smith. The inspector also cuts through hypocrisy when Gerald claims that uh, he just happened to get the keys of his friend's flat. Um, the inspector is quite clear that his first intention was to keep Eva Smith, Daisy Renton, as a mistress. In other words, 
this wasn't an accident, it is something that Gerald had planned. Again, showing how the upper-class male exploits the working-class female. Priestley's anger at the way women are treated, um, we might pick up from the inspector here, um, having read Eva's diary after her affair with Gerald is over. She felt there'd never be anything as good again for her, so she had to make it last longer. This is a deep irony. Here is a woman who has fallen in love with a man who does not love her and has cast her aside as soon as it suited him. And this is the very best she can hope for in life, the very happiest she will ever be. This is a metaphor for just how cruel the upper classes are to the poor. It's their poverty which makes them victims. The inspector feels it is his duty to expose hypocrisy. And this is why he attacks Mrs Burling for lying, for not telling the truth, and why he asserts that what he is doing is his duty, exposing the lies of the upper classes, not just to the working classes or to the audience in the theatre, but actually exposing it to themselves, because it is only this way that he can hope to change their behaviour. But it is in the discussions with Mrs Burling that we find out the inspector is not all-powerful. She says she has done something wrong, and you know it, and the inspector's words, though powerful, reveal how little confidence he might have that he's able to change Mrs Burling's views. I think you did something terribly wrong. The emphasis on I already presupposes that she didn't. And you're going to spend the rest of your life regretting it. But that is linked to, I think, he doesn't know this. And this is prescient and foreshadowing um, Mrs Burling's rejection of that lesson in Act 3. Consequently, the inspector appeals to her as a woman and a mother. And so appeals to her caring side. She was here alone, friendless, almost penniless, desperate. She needed not only money but advice, sympathy, friendliness. This listing in Patterns of Three emphasises his attempt to emotionally appeal to her. You've had children, he said. You must have known what she was feeling and you slammed the door in her face. And interestingly, this is an appeal which seems to fail and perhaps we then look at her role as a mother. She is not somebody that her children love, and the inspector has failed in getting Mrs Burlings to change her mind. Now the scene changes, and we sense the inspector's desperation to attack her. We get that in a series of questions. Why didn't? And then these statements. I'm not asking you. I want to know. Why didn't? I warn you. We can feel the ferocity of his anger as he begins to close in on her. But at the same time, there's this sense that she might still slip through his grasp. However, the inspector's questioning reveals just how cleverly he has planned his attack. Uh, he gets her to admit that she's not sorry what she's done to the girl, and then he gets her to say who is to blame. He knows that she is going to blame the father of the child, and he also knows that that father will turn out to be Eric. In other words, he is doing what Sheila said he would do, giving them just enough rope to hang themselves. And again, he returns to his duty. He is waiting for Eric, waiting to do his duty, and accuse the most guilty member of the family, because he is the one who has actually committed a crime. As we approach the end of the act, it is also worth considering the inspector not just as a mouthpiece for Priestley, but also as the vehicle who drives the drama of the act. He ends up waiting, knowing what he has to do, 
as the audience come to realise that Eric is the father of the unborn child. In this way, the inspector carries the dramatic action of the play, as well as Priestley's views on socialism. The most dramatic thing about the inspector in Act 3 is that he's going to disappear in the middle of it. Uh, this is a very bold move by Priestley, because he's not around to push forward Priestley's message. When he departs, Priestley hopes that the inspector has done enough to change the minds of his audience. Um, and interestingly, he won't have done enough to change the minds of the characters within the play, at least not all of them. The inspector works quite hard to be inclusive, so when Eric comes in and says, you know, don't you, meaning that you know I'm the father of um, Eva's child, the inspector is very inclusive. He says, yes, we know. He's desperate for this guilt to be shared, for everybody to acknowledge what they've done wrong, and his language reflects that. He also starts to take control more thoroughly. Uh, so Burling is very firm that he doesn't want Eric to have a drink. And immediately the inspector says, yes, um, let him do it. I know that he's your son, but by implication, the inspector saying, although this is your house and this is your son, I'm taking control now. And he gives Eric another drink. And this also gives us pause for thought when we see Eric accepting the inspector's view of the world, we must remember that Eric does it while drunk. What will he feel when he's sober? Now the inspector plays a rather interesting game. He needs Eric to admit his part in the wrongdoing, but that won't be difficult because he's already ready to confess the moment he enters. And we can see from this really quick exchange here that the inspector is very accusatory. However, in his language, he has to be quite cautious because he still wants Eric to be on his side. Uh, so his next question is, did you meet Eva by appointment? Um, this use of the word appointment gives the clue that it's a business transaction. Uh, she's going to have sex with him for money. Uh, it turns out, no, it's not for an appointment. And so the inspector then accuses Eric very subtly of simply getting Eva drunk, you know, not really even having to pay her for sex, just paying her in drinks. Um, and there's this implication that Eva's been reduced um, to the state of an alcoholic. Um, Eric takes this to be a description of himself, more drinks for him, and to say that he wasn't quite so drunk this time. Uh, but the inspector's language reveals that's not what he means, but you took her home again. Uh, this word took might seem quite innocent, but it shows how Eric has treated her as a possession. And then the irony of this description here, you've had sex again. Now, the first time they had sex was very likely to have been a rape. Uh, and he uses this term, you may love again. Um, Eric can't quite swallow this. No, I wasn't really in love with her. And he begins to acknowledge um, how cruel his exploitation of Eva has been. Again, his language towards Eric is incredibly subtle. He says here, did she suggest that you ought to marry her? And that's, at the time, what any decent man would do once he'd got a woman pregnant. But Eva has risen above this and not insisted that Eric marry her. In other words, she hasn't got pregnant in order to trap him. Um, a quite reasonable thing for her to do as the only way to escape poverty. Uh, Eric doesn't. And then look at the subtlety of this. So what did you propose to do? Rather than want, he uses this word propose to subtly reinforce the fact that Eric should have married her. And of course, the reason he didn't wasn't because that he didn't love her, but because she was from a far lower class and because she'd already given in to him for sex. At this point, 
we come to the most difficult part of the play, for me at any rate. Um, when the inspector asks how much Eric has given her, the reply is £50. Now, there are 20 shillings in a pound, and you'll remember that Eva went on strike in order to get 25 shillings, shillings a week instead of around 24. So, £50 is the equivalent of about 48, 49 weeks of work. So this is nearly a year's salary that Eric has given Eva. Now, there's no suggestion that he's been with her for a full year. That's an extraordinary amount of money. And yet, um, that money runs out and she commits suicide. Um, That doesn't quite ring true here, unless Eric has been keeping her for a full 12 months. Which is impossible, because only last summer she was having an affair with Gerald, and then she spent two months at the seaside. So, this is a kind of gap in the middle of the play here. The inspector needs to expose Eric for giving her £50, because that's the amount he has to steal from Burling. It has to be a significant amount. But the plot sort of unravels here, because if Eric had given her quite that much money, she would never have been destitute or driven towards suicide. But the inspector's purpose is really to reveal the crime. You stole the money. Although all the characters have been immoral um, towards Eva, it's only Eric who has committed a crime, and uh, added to that is the possible crime of rape. The reason that the inspector keeps Eric till last is quite a simple one. If he is to change the future, and by that I mean how the ruling classes... Uh, the wealthy, treat the poor, then it is the men he has to reach because they hold the reins of power. And Eric is going to take over from Burling. So Eric is the person he most needs to persuade. Consequently, Eric is the person whose wrongdoing needs to be most dramatic. And that's why it's kept to last. And that's why the inspector exposes it as a crime. And then there's this quite interesting line here, I haven't much time... Many readers, or many uh, people in the audience, assume this to be a supernatural reference. He's got to try and change their mind quickly, otherwise the actual death, represented by the second phone call, will occur. And so there's this idea that the fate is in the balance here uh, for Eva. She can actually be saved if the Burlings change their minds. And then... They have to divide the responsibility afterwards. They all have to accept they are responsible and then argue afterwards about how responsible they all are. Of course, we'll see that this plan backfires. And so, as we move towards the inspector's final words, we can sense a sense of desperation. But each of you helped to kill her. Remember that. Never forget it. Remember what you did. Remember what you did. Uh, The fact that he has to repeat this quite so often suggests that he doesn't fully believe that they will. Uh, He realises that he's probably going to fail. At least that is one reading of it. Another reading, reading is to look at how masterful he is and to see these as prophetic words. He is actually going to make them all remember what they did. The possibility that the inspector can see into the future is emphasised by his words here. And now, she, being Eva, will make you pay a heavier price still. Well, she's died, so what could be a heavier price than that? And it must be war. We can imagine Gerald and Eric going off to war and dying. Uh, They simply wouldn't be able to change the future because they won't be around to shape it. Given that Eric has given Eva quite so much money, we might assume his relationship with Eva to have been much the same as Gerald Croft's, but the inspector is keen to draw a distinction, though he at least had some affection for her and made her happy for time. And uh, this suggests that Eric's treatment of Eva 
was far worse and again suggests that he has exploited her far more fully and may indeed have raped her in that first encounter. As the inspector leaves, his message is prophetic and he uses the language um, of the Bible here. We are members of one body and Christians see the church as one body and they are together in the one body of Christ. They in fact eat and drink um, that body in the communion service. The, the bread is representative of his body and the wine representative of his blood. Now, this is quite a powerful invocation from the inspector. Everyone at uh, that time, 1945, would likely have been a church-going Christian, at least a massive percentage of the population. And although not everybody would be a socialist, by allying the language of the church to the language of socialism, he is suggesting to his audience that the only proper moral choice is to take a socialist worldview and abandon a capitalist one. And the consequences of not doing that is this. If men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. And this is prophesying the First World War and, of course, the Second World War. The inspector is made to do this by Priestley because he is publishing the play in 1945, at the very end of the Second World War. And, as you will see from my other videos... The two deaths of Eva represent the two world wars and it's the problem of the ruling classes that they did not learn the lessons of the First World War that caused the massive slaughter of the second.